I think we can uh, start. People are still um, coming in, but that's fine. We can start. Um, okay. So, hi, Shalom. My name is Abir, Abir Malyanker. I'm the Shaliach, the Israel Emissary, Director of Israel Engagement here in the community uh, uh, BJ of BJ. Uh, I'm so happy and thrilled to be here today and to open this um, um, series of um, um, discussing US and Israel relations, uh, sort of a try, uh, a big aspiration of uh, trying to conclude a decade of uh, relations and what a, decade, what a decade we have. <clears throat> I want to start with something um, um, a little more personal or more connected to me. Uh, 10 years ago, I was here, you know, a shaliach is, uh, is someone that comes for, uh, for a, a period of time and, um, and to a specific community. And I, I, this is my second tenure um, or as a shaliach. 10 years ago, I was a shaliach as well. Uh, a young emissary, a young shaliach in New Jersey. So not, not, uh, not far from uh, where we are today, not far from BJ. Um, but, and, uh, and I came to BJ like a year ago. And I can tell you that something, uh, just as from a personal experience, something changed. I mean, uh, when I'm saying change, I mean uh, in regard to Israel, something uh, in my feeling, in my conversation with people, not only in the community, but also outside in the public sphere. When, uh, when, when I say to people that I'm Israeli, when, um, when, when discussing this uh, chatting with people, um, something in the, in, in the environment, in the atmosphere, maybe more criticism, sometimes the opposite, um, more uh, affiliation or assuming things. And I think uh, this uh, is not representing too much, but it does say something about uh, of what we're going to speak about today. Uh, and um, in, in the next session as well. So without further ado, I want to introduce our great speakers today um, uh, to discuss uh, US-Israel relations from, uh, a pers from the perspective of the Israel-Palestinian conflict. So uh, today we have the privilege to have with us uh, Professor David Myers, uh, who is a Sadi and Ludwig Kant professor of Jewish history at UCLA, where he serves as director of the UCLA Laskin Center for History and Policy. He's the author or editor of 15 books in the field of Jewish history. Uh, Myers also serves as, a pre as the president of the New Israel Fund. And uh, to converse with him, to have a conversation with him, we have uh, Dr. Hussein Ibish who is a senior resident scholar at the Arab Gulf State Institute in Washington and a weekly communist for the Bloomberg Opinion and the National uh, at the Emirates. He previously served as a senior fellow at the American Task Force uh, on Palestine, executive director of the Foundation of Arab American Leadership and the communication director for the American Arab Discrimination Commun Committee. He has a PhD in comparative literature from the University of Massachusetts, Emirates. So I want to start with thank you uh, for being with us and, uh, and spend some time with us discussing, discussing this important uh, subject. The stage is yours. Thank you, Abir. Uh, good evening, everyone. Erev Tov, Shavua Tov. Uh, Abir, I should just tell you that while you were talking, I admitted some people, but now the task is yours. Um, I throw that back to you. Um, it's really a pleasure to be here with you, and it's a, an especial pleasure to be here with my friend Hussein Ibish, with whom I've been talking about Israel-Palestine for um, a long time. Um, we've taken our show uh, from coast to coast, um, principally focused on exploring the history of the Israel-Palestine conflict through two sets of lenses, through the, the, the lenses of uh, Israelis, Israeli Jews in particular, and through the lenses of Palestinians. Um, tonight, we're going to shift our focus to um, something a little bit more recent in time, the last decade in relations, and we're, our focus will really be on uh, the relationship between the United States and Israel uh, and all of the implications thereof. Um, I want to just say uh, one more word of introduction, which is it's a great pleasure to be here um, 
with you, uh, members of the BJ community, which um, I know and have been part of um, on visits to New York and uh, considered to be one of the really special uh, prayer and meditative spaces uh, in the world. Um, uh, I have just the highest regard for the community, um, for Rabbi Roli Matalon, uh, and to my new friend, Abir, um, and it's really a great pleasure to be here with you. So, um, where should we start? Um, the, the, the temporal framing of uh, the evening is a decade, and I think, when I think of a decade, um, I'm reminded of the long Netanyahu decade. So I want to begin by talking about Israel um, and what has been going on over the last extended decade. Um, and you'll understand what I mean in a minute. Um, I'm then just going to um, hand things over to Hussein and we're going to have a kind of free-flowing conversation uh, for about 40 minutes or so, and then we'll open for questions. Um, so as many of you know, Israel is hurtling toward uh, yet another election, the fourth election over the last two years, um, if the Knesset does not pass a budget by December 23rd, as stipulated in the coalition agreement between the two main parties, the Likud of Benjamin Netanyahu and the Blue-White Party headed by Benny Gantz, then there will be elections. Now, if there are elections, it means there will not be a rotation uh, in the position of prime minister, which is to say, Benny Gantz will not assume the position of prime minister as stipulated in the coalition agreement uh, in November 2021. Um, this is something that uh, Benjamin Netanyahu has uh, a, a real interest in forestalling. Um, and in that regard, um, it would seem that Netanyahu has an interest in going to elections. Um, but it, in fact, it was Gantz who agitated for the Knesset no confidence vote that set in motion this uh, this ticking of the clock until December 23rd, after which there will be mandated elections. So um, all of this is to say is that it's very hard to figure out what's up and what's down. Um, Netanyahu is a very masterful tact tactician, especially when it comes to utilizing the electoral process, um, as I'll mention in just a bit. Agans is much less experienced um, and may have, in fact, uh, boxed himself into a corner um, in uh, calling for elections because the SNAP polls that have been taken so far uh, after uh, it became uh, a probability, a likelihood and then a probability that there would be elections, show that the blue white party would lose a significant number of seats in the Knesset. Currently, blue white has 30 out of 120 seats in the Knesset, the Kuhn has 36, um, and some polls show blue white uh, falling to as low as 10 seats. So uh, a really dramatic, precipitous decline, um, which again raises the question, what's, what's Benny Gantz's interest here? Um, and uh, we can perhaps discuss that further. According to the SNAP polls, the uh, Likud would decline as well. Um, uh, in some polls, uh, as, much, uh, uh, as much as 14 seats. Um, who would gain? Uh, that is the uh, question of the day. And so far, the polls show that a party to the right of Benjamin Netanyahu party, in fact, a party called basically rightward, the right party, Yamina, uh, led by uh, Naftali Bennett, would be uh, the new rising force uh, in uh, Israeli political life. The last election that was held was just last March, um, and that was uh, a, an election um, that uh, led to a coalition very much uh, stitched together um, in the age of uh, COVID um, um, with uh, uh, the impending sense of, of crisis um, and very much animated by a sense of uh, emergency. Um, there too, uh, Bibi Netanyahu found his way to the top, uh, even though he was under indictment. Um, and in the prior two elections, um, estimates were that uh, his party uh, might, in fact, uh, not be in a position to forge a, uh, a winning coalition. But uh, through uh, his uh, manifold political skills, um, he managed to find himself as prime minister uh, in all of those elections. Um, he's used elections as really um, a key form of political survival. He is nothing if not a survivor. Um, and I think there are two ways to look at this, um, uh, this uh, 
series of elections and Netanyahu's feats of survival. One can see it in the first instance as a reflection of tremendous instability, constant uh, dissolutions of parliament, constant elections, no budget passed since 2018. Um, all of these are indicators of very considerable instability. But I think one can also see uh, the last two years as a sign of a tremendous degree of stability uh, because it has allowed Benjamin Netanyahu to stay in power for an astonishingly long period of time, since 2009, a record without parallel in Israeli history. He has served as prime minister longer than anyone else, including David Ben-Gurion, the founding prime minister of the state of Israel. Why is that? How is it that we see this curious form of stability manifested in constant elections, but in which the outcome seems to be the same every time? Uh, first, as I suggested, um, I'm gonna uh, enumerate five or six reasons why I think this is so. Um, Netanyahu's great skill. He's a master tactician. He's masterful at outmaneuvering and often killing off his political rivals. Um, he's proven this capacity over the course of his entire career, um, including extending back to uh, the infamous election of 1995-96, just after the assassination of Yitzhak Rabin, um, when uh, sort of the uh, Netanyahu marshaled the full-throated um, uh, language of vilification uh, to uh, overcome what seemed to be an insurmount insurmountable lead by uh, acting Prime Minister Shimon Peres after the assassination of Rabin. Um, so Netanyahu has proven uh, a time and again that he's just uh, uh, a masterful uh, uh, tactician. The second reason why I think we see uh, his, him remaining in power for this long Netanyahu decade beginning in 2009, is because of the Israeli parliamentary system, which doesn't require mass po massive popularity. In fact, Netanyahu is not massively popular um, compared to American uh, presidential uh, candidates' favorability readies. His are considerably lower uh, most often. Um, you need 25 to 30% of the vote to uh, be asked to lead, uh, to put together a ruling coalition. Um, and that's what, and he understands uh, electoral math very well, um, and you understand what it takes uh, to put together a winning coalition. So the Israeli parliamentary system helps explain uh, his success as well. Third, and I think of greater um, consequence in terms of uh, the long duration of the decade is the dissolution of the left. Um, we can trace this back to uh, the decline of the Oslo peace process and uh, the outbreak of the Second Intifada. Um, but certainly over the last decade of Netanyahu's rule, uh, we've seen a further evisceration of the left, particularly the center left, uh, once represented by the Labor Party, which, as you know, was the dominant force in Israeli politics from the creation of the state in 1948 to what is known as the Mahapach, the upending in 1977 when uh, the longstanding opposition party Likud uh, was elected and uh, Menachem Begin assumed the uh, position of prime minister. Um, and the reasons for labor's decline and virtual disappearance are many, um, and we don't have time to uh, enumerate them all, but amongst them are certainly considerable political ineptitude and arrogance um, and a total disconnect from the voters. Um, there, is, there was a carryover, a deep sense of resentment towards labor, especially amongst Mizrahi voters uh, who felt that they were treated in a patronizing, paternalistic, and condescending way by the Ashkenazi-dominated uh, labor elite. Um, since uh, 1977, um, labor has had ample opportunity to uh, mend its ways and, and uh, uh, find a different way to reach out to uh, um, its extended base um, and to expand its base, but it hasn't proved capable of doing so, uh, both because of uh, the effective evisceration of labor by, uh, by its political enemies like Likud, but also because of the party's own ineptitude. Um, one should also note at the same time the rise uh, in numerical significance of uh, the joint Arab list. Um, so there is indeed a left force um, that is one of the largest opposition parties uh, in the Knesset. But the center left that once was the dominant bloc 
has virtually disappeared. So that's another reason for Netanyahu's capacity to survive. A fourth is uh, the Palestinian uh, uh, world, and particularly the world of the Palestinian Authority, run by Mahmoud Abbas, who is you know, in year 15 of a five-year term. Uh, since 2009, he's been serving an indefinite term as president. Um, and the, the PA was never from its inception a paragon of efficiency or influence, but under Abbas, it's become even more ineffectual um, and disconnected from, uh, from people uh, in, in uh, the West Bank in particular. Um, a fifth factor um, that helps explain uh, the survival of Netanyahu, especially in the latter half of this decade, uh, this long decade that begins in 2009, uh, is the rise of Donald Trump to power. Uh, Donald, Trump, Donald Trump proved to be uh, the biggest booster of Bibi Netanyahu imaginable um, and a stark departure, as we'll talk about in just a bit, from uh, Barack Obama. He has uh, lent cover to Netanyahu at almost every turn, uh, including on the eve of elections, um, and helps uh, his presence certainly helps explain uh, Netanyahu's survival. Um, so we've talked about some local factors. Um, there are certainly very important bilateral factors, uh, American support for Netanyahu, Trump's support for Netanyahu, but perhaps the most important factor in explaining uh, the survival, the endurance of Netanyahu is a global factor. Um, and that is um, really the reign of what we might call illiberal populism in the world. Um, and I wanna call attention to the year 2009 uh, because it's in that year that two key figures regained office uh, and have been in power ever since. One is Benjamin Netanyahu, um, who regained office after the demise of Ehud Olmert uh, to uh, his own corruption issues. Um, and the second is Viktor Orban, the prime minister of Hungary, who had been prime minister for one tour of duty, duty earlier and then uh, regain power um, in, I think it was 2010. So 2009, 2010, uh, you have the return to power of these two figures, um, both of whom are architects of what Orban proudly calls illiberal democracy. Illiberal democracy says, if you gain a majority of the popular vote or put together a winning coalition, then you can institute majoritarianism that protects the interests of the in-group, of the majority group, and weakens uh, the uh, protections and rights of uh, those in a minority position. Um, this version of democracy, as it were, also empowers those in power to change or discard the rules of the democratic game. Um, and this is uh, something that we have seen really across the board. Uh, from Israel, Turkey, to uh, Hungary, Poland, uh, Boris Johnson in the UK, and Donald Trump uh, in Washington. Uh, once elected, uh, there's a belief that this <clears throat> entitles one to change the democratic game. Um, and these rules have been in vogue uh, in Israel since uh, the reemergence of Bibi Netanyahu, uh, the rejuvenation of Bibi Netanyahu, uh, that occurred in 2009 when he assumed once again the position of prime minister. Um, over that period of time, we have seen um, really a, a, a raft of anti-democratic legislative acts, uh, a raft of majoritarian democratic acts culminating in the nation state law in the summer of 2018. Um, and I think that larger global context of illiberal democ democracy helps us understand uh, the tight alliance between Bibi Netanyahu and Donald Trump, who himself is another illiberal populist, uh, indeed uh, the most powerful illiberal populist in the world. So these are some of the reasons that I think we can understand um, the relative stability over the last decade. And I say that um, with some measure of irony because of the frequency of elections, the almost Italianate nature of uh, electoral uh, battles in Israel over the last couple of years. Yeah. I do yeah. believe that we are coming in some sense toward the end of the long Netanyahu decade, which is now in its 11th or 12th year. Uh, but nonetheless, um, I think we can understand his stability owing to these factors that I've mentioned. Yeah. Um, we probably should turn our attention to changes in uh, 
the United States, which well, are me, very much And I'm going to I'm going to hand things over to you, uh, uh, Hussein, to jump in. Yeah, no, I just have two things to add about the decade of Netanyahu vis-a-vis -vis Israel's relations with the United States. One is, <clears throat> um, you're right to link Netanyahu and Trump in terms of uh, global populism and this oxymoronic euphemism, illiberal democracy. There's really nothing um, democratic about it. Um, but I think there's something a little deeper. Um, Netanyahu, more than any other international leader in, in, a, um, in a US partner state has <clears throat> identified with one party over another for a long period of time in the United States. Netanyahu is a Republican. He, and he's not just with Trump because they're both illiberal populist demagogues and, and authoritarian majoritarians. No, he was all in on Mitt Romney, right? He, he heavily intervened. Uh, he didn't like Obama, but he's, he's been kind of a Republican all along. He's almost an American, right? And he's pretty much insofar as he, he is sort of culturally very close to the United States, he clearly identifies with Republicans, both the traditional Reaganite Republicans and also now the new uh, Trumpian uh, nationalists. So that's, it's very important because what it has done is it has greatly contributed to the politicization of Israel as a partisan issue in the United States, pre Netanyahu and pre a lot of other things, some of them linked to Netanyahu, some of them not linked to Netanyahu, like the radical partisan division in the United States, the rise of this evangelical tinged populist um, white nationalist, frankly, Christian supremacist right wing that Trump embodies on the right and <clears throat> a, an anti-Israeli or Israel skeptical um, left in the Democratic Party, you know, the kind of Bernie Sanders, AOC, the Democratic Socialists who didn't really exist in any um, major numbers but the squad and Uncle Bernie and all these guys who are who are uh, skeptical of Israel, some of them, uh, you know, are are not at all fans of of, of Israel. And certainly, Rashid Tlaib is a is a Palestinian with a Palestinian perspective, and and is not a fan of of, of Israel. So Israel has, which had been a nonpartisan issue since it became a major foreign policy concern of the United States after 1967. It was there was basically a consensus, or if there were divisions, they were not partisan divisions. And increasingly, it has become a partisan issue. Israel is a little bit protected from that in the way that another state that has become a partisan issue without having been a partisan issue before Saudi Arabia is not, because Israel has support on the left from mainstream Democrats, from Jewish groups in the Democratic Party, labor groups and others, and, and on the right from evangelicals and neoconservatives and, and others who like Israel. On both sides of the equation, there are Americans who will go to bat for Israel. Very few, if any, will go to bat for Saudi Arabia. But in both cases, we've seen uh, the issue become partisan. And I think Netanyahu uh, more than MBS, more than anybody has just aligned with not just with Trump. Uh, I mean, there's a, this affiliation between MBS and Kushner and MBS and Trump and the, the Saud family and the Trump family, but it's, it's less with the Republicans as a party. And I think Netanyahu has aligned himself and therefore Netanyahu's Israel with the Republicans in a way that is gonna have really interesting ramifications and already has. The second right. thing is when Netanyahu came into power, he was running specifically against the Oslo agreements that were done by Rabin and, and maintained by Perez. And his first goal, you know, I think he, we didn't have to read between the line very much, was to try to stop the further implementation, to freeze things where they were when he took over. There, he did, there was this little adjustment at, in the Y River Accord. That's the last time they were adjusted in a meaningful way. But basically it was to freeze the situation with phase one of the implementation of the 1993 Declaration of Principles and the other documents. Over time, that opposition to Oslo, to trying to freeze it, has morphed into or developed, evolved into a plan to sort of put it in deep freeze, as uh, Del Weisglass 
put it, and I'm Sharon's old advisor. And uh, ultimately, now with the help of Trump, to regard to cast the 1993 Declaration of Principles and other signed documents that form the bedrock of the two-state solution and the peace process and the terms of reference for negotiation, to treat them as a dead letter to treat them as having been, you know, being OBEs, you know, sort of anachronistic relics of the past, no longer applicable, no longer of interest, et cetera. Uh, and there's definitely an effort to move the ball and use the Trump Kushner peace to prosperity plan that we got last January. It didn't go anywhere, but did prompt the, the UAE's um, rec, 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 uh, normalization process with Israel, it then led to the Bahrain one and then the Sudan one, and I'm sure there will be others, um, as a way of kind of preventing the implementation of that document. But I do think um, a, a, a right-wing Israeli government is going to still try to use the Kushner document as a starting point for negotiations. And, and that has been a goal that um, Netanyahu is single-mindedly pursued and he's come very close to realizing it. Uh, it is no longer the case that you have to be a crazy extremist in the United States to basically say you're against the two-state solution. There is space now, especially on the right, to be openly in favor of uh, a greater Israel that has to be called an apartheid state and which would contain little Palestinian boundaries and the main purpose of which would be to um, it's, uh, quarantine Palestinians from participation in Israel's uh, political process. <laughs> that would be the purpose of it. Uh, so under such circumstances, um, you know, it's, it, it, it becomes therefore, uh, I think, a, a real question um, about, uh, you know, what, what the impact of that legacy will be uh, on Israel-US relations, on Israel's relations with Jewish Americans, many of whom are not convinced about this, uh, Democrats who are not convinced about this, and even internationalist Republicans who are not convinced about this. Yeah, so I wanna just jump in maybe on your first point and then we can unpack more of your second point. Um, yeah. Because the Netanyahu decade um, is, um, uh, it presents us with a temporal frame that's so interesting in American terms because it evenly divides between the, the Obama era and the, and the Trump era. That's right. Um, and, you, you, you know, the, the key pivot point may well be, as you rightly pointed out, um, uh, Bibi's growing identification with the Republican Party as yes. reflected symbolically in his speech before Congress in 2015. So right. smack in the middle of that decade, we have this pivot uh, toward an overtly partisan embrace of one political party um, and an overt uh, disregard for existing uh, protocol um, and uh, respect oh, for the offices of the president. No, no, treaty obligations. Those are signed. Those are signed treaties. I mean, the DOP is not a protocol. It's a, it's a signed obligation. So, no, no, I'm talking about his appearance in his appearance in nothing else. Oh, appearance I see in what Congress, you mean. Protocol vis-a-vis. -vis, oh, I get you. Sorry, forgive me. Okay. No, no, I wasn't talking about why or anything. Yeah. Oh, so, and I think that gives us, you know, an opportunity to really ask the question of what's going on in this decade from an American perspective. So. Um, we have uh, one important starting point might be March 2010, when Vice President Joe Biden lands in uh, Israel um, to the news that on that very day, uh, Israel announced uh, that it was building 1,600 new housing units in Ramat Shlomo in, um, uh, in uh, the outskirts of Jerusalem, um, which was, uh, to Biden's mind, uh, in occupied territory. Um, this came as a slap in the face to Joe Biden, who regarded Bibi Netanyahu as a good friend um, and as someone who would not try to show him up in this kind of uh, public demeaning way. But it was already a signal uh, that Netanyahu was sending uh, that things were gonna be different, uh, that he was indeed going to adopt a far more par partisan uh, approach um, and indeed regarded Barack Obama uh, not as a friend or ally, but in fact, as an adversary. Um, and I think that, uh, sensibility really carried through uh, the Obama era, um, which is why um, uh, the arrival of Trump was greeted with such great relief, uh, because Hillary Clinton was seen as a continuation of the Obama doctrine, the Obama policy. Yeah. Now, just as this is occurring, 
um, as we see this kind of Manichaean divide between the Obama era and the Biden era, we see a stark and growing uh, distinction uh, in uh, political interests between uh, the large majority of American Jews and a large majority of Israeli Jews. Exactly. Um, a kind of stunning, uh, stunning um, a set of developments that are exacerbated over the course of this decade from 2010 to 2020. Um, just to give you an indication of what this looks like, uh, estimates are that 76% of American Jews voted for Joe Biden. Um, and estimates are on the eve of the poll that some 70% of Israeli Jews favored Trump over Biden. Uh, curiously enough, a plurality of Israeli Arabs, of Palestinian Israelis, also uh, favored uh, Trump over Biden by, by about half that number. Um, and this suggests uh, that stark dichotomies are indeed emerging, um, not necessarily between, not only between uh, Democrats and, uh, and, and Republicans, but between Israeli Jews and American Jews. And here, I think it's important to pick up on a point that Hussein made, um, which may be the key hinge in the, the whole uh, shifting game, which is the uh, uh, Christian evangelical right. Um, mm -hmm. Netanyahu recognized early on that this was a political constituency of enormous importance uh, mm -hmm. to Israel and to the electoral fortunes of presidential candidates in the United States. Mm -hmm. Um, and in fact, this is an old um, revisionist Zionist trope. Uh, Jabotinsky was interested in, uh, in uh, alliances with uh, the Christian Falange, amongst others. Uh, uh, Menachem Begin uh, was uh, uh, close to Jerry Falwell um, and sought to really begin to stitch together this new alliance, not so much with liberal American Jews, who Milton Himmelfarb famously uh, noted in 1964, earned like Episcopalians and voted like Puerto Ricans. Um, mm -hmm. uh, Begin understood that there had to be a different way uh, if he was going to really make any uh, uh, political headway um, in his own career in the United States. Netanyahu recognized this rather early and understood the enormous power of uh, the ev evangelical right and I think made a calculated decision to discard um, the largely liberal progressive Jewish majority in the United States to ally with a much smaller, albeit vocal, minority within the uh, American Jewish community, which itself was closely connected to uh, the evangelical right and to organizations like KUFI, Christians United for Israel, under the leadership of uh, Reverend John Hagee. Worth, um, worth noting for a second that what brings them together ultimately, other than political calculation and political interest, personal political interest or party political interest, is an agreement about a greater Israel. It's about the occupation and annexation. I mean, that's where these two sides see eye to eye. Nowhere else. Uh, and that's what divides them from everybody else. I think so ultimately I, that's what it comes down to. I think that's that's ultimately what the distinction between Obama and and yeah. Trump comes down to. Will you uh, either uh, mm -hmm. uh, tacitly uh, uh, or quietly disapprove? Uh, will you or or, or or will you uh, or will you give a green light to uh, to uh, to ongoing Israeli settlement in the West Bank? Um, this is what uh, Netanyahu understood with respect to uh, the evangelical right. This is what he understood with the Trump team. And this was a very significant difference from the Obama era, where there was not tacit but vocal disagreement right. with Israeli settlement policy. And the interesting question, as we now have placed on the table, the prospect, the specter of yeah. the end of bipartisanship um, is how Biden will play it. Right. Um, now that there have been various important fait accompli, including in American foreign policy, what can be rolled back? So yeah, that, that's the embassy true. in Jerusalem is not going to be rolled back. No. Uh, can you roll back uh, some of the green lighting uh, of Israeli settlement activities as symbolized by the visit last week, or was it the week before of Secretary of State, Secretary, Secretary of State Mike Pompeo to a settlement? Um, uh, the first time uh, an American official of that standing had, had actually uh, lent uh, his powers of validation upon the settlement project.
Can there be a crawling back from that? I think that's really the question. I'll throw it back to you, Hussein. To yeah, I, I think I think the question is yes. I mean, this is my very next column. It should be out in the next few days for Bloomberg Opinion. Um, I agree. The embassy is not going back, but you know, there the. the under Trump, first of all, relations with the Palestinians have been brought to zero, right? All the aid, not just to the Palestinian Authority, but to Palestinian institutions like Palestinian hospitals in East Jerusalem uh, and elsewhere, uh, to UNRWA, the agency in the UN that cares for Palestinian refugees, to person-to-person peace-building programs, anything that smacks of support for anything remotely Palestinian has been cut to zero. It's a Trumpian thing. You pile on pressure and you say, no, I'm taking away everything. Now you give me what I want so I can give you back parts of it. I mean, that's sort of how they look at it. It's a sort of um, weird real estate approach, I think. Um, you know, obviously Biden is going to restore much of the aid and the Palestinians are know they're going to have to fix the way they allocate aid to prisoners' families because over time it's morphed into something that looks like it rewards bigger sentences, which means worse crimes of prisoners. And some, so you have some people who've done some really bad things, their families get more than car thieves. And, and that, that sends the wrong message. I, I understand how it happened. It really isn't like a plot to encourage terrorism, but um, it, it looks that way from the outside. Um, and so they've got to fix that and they know it. Um, they've got to, they, they have resumed because of Biden. The Palestinian Authority has resumed cooperation with Israel. They suspended all cooperation uh, with the government of Israel, the civil authority, security cooperation. They refused to take their money. And I don't know if you all understand that under the Oslo agreements, the main source of Palestinian income, like any third world entity, is import export taxes and other excise taxes, not income taxes, but taxes on commercial activity, right? Especially import ex export and, and excise and, and licensing fees and things like that. And most of it in the Palestinian context is, is import-export. That's very typical of developing societies. And uh, because Palestinians don't, under the Oslo Agreement, are not sovereign, uh, and they still live under Israeli control, and full Israeli control, um, with islands, little pockets of, of self-government, they don't control the, the uh, means of ingress and egress of not only people, but goods and services. So they can't really tax and the Israelis were not willing to allow them to tax. So the Israeli government collects the Palestinian taxes and hands them over to the PA, right? Uh, rather than allowing the PA to do that because that's too much sovereignty, according to the, the Oslo logic and structure. In refusing to deal with the Israelis, Palestinians have also been refusing to take their tax money, which is a bit, most of their monthly budget, which you know uh, pays for the public salaries and other things in, in the West Bank. So they get their money back, there'll be security cooperation, things like that is restored. Uh, for sure, uh, uh, Biden is not gonna move the embassy back, but he can do a couple of other things. He can restore the PLO mission in Washington, the Palestinian embassy in DC, which I think he will do fairly quickly. And they could start it out as a, as a consular section, right? Because documents have not been approved. I mean, there's been nobody in DC to do that. So it's been very difficult for people who do legal work and, and um, corporate you know, investment work in Palestine. It's, it's, you can't, you can't v verify your documents. It's, it's really basic. Um, or they might just reopen it altogether. And then there's, there was a US embassy to the Palestinians, which was the consulate in East Jerusalem. Um, Friedman, the uh, very extreme uh, uh, Trump uh, ambassador yes. to Israel, was able to, when they moved the embassy to Jerusalem, to close the consulate in East Jerusalem and suck it all in to the embassy under his control so that there was no Palestinian embassy in Washington and no U.S. de facto embassy of the Palestinians. You can easily reverse that. You can easily reopen the consulate in East Jerusalem so the Palestinians can actually get to you. You know, having a mission to Palestinians in West Jerusalem is pointless. Very few Palestinians can get to West Jerusalem. Uh, you know, it's just, it's just absolutely, it's hard enough to get to East Jerusalem. So uh, he can certainly do that. Uh, and, you know, he can reiterate opposition to settlements, and I think he will. He can certainly reverse the State Department's uh, comment that, that uh, settlement products should be, you know, listed as made in Israel. 
Uh, it's interesting Bahrain just reversed that because initially they were not going to give a special designation for settlement goods and now they're saying they will. Uh, and the Europeans are very big on that. So I think there'll be, there'll be a pretty big distinction. But one thing that um, uh, Biden doesn't inherit from either Trump or his own Obama-Biden administration is a viable um, peace process, right? And it did die in uh, Obama term one. I think what David was describing about uh, Biden showing up and being told about settlements going up was a key moment. But basically the whole flap uh, that the United States had in Obama's first term with Netanyahu and Israel over the settlement freeze, the 10 month settlement freeze was the last nail in the coffin of viable negotiations. It was the end of viable negotiations and all three sides contributed to its failure. Obama made a demand without being willing to back it up. Uh, Israel did this double uh, take where they agreed to a 10 month settlement freeze but with enough caveats and grandfatherings and whatnot and, and exemptions in the 10th month period that settlement activity didn't actually slow down and they wouldn't extend it for three months more when it would have started to slow down settlement expansion. And the Palestinians, even though some of us, myself included, who were you know, on better terms with them at that time, I mean the leadership, were begging them not to believe for a second that Obama was gonna, get able, uh, was gonna be able to, to get Israel to stop settlement activity uh, of any meaningful sense for a long period of time and not to you know, get out on a limb with no way out, but they went right ahead and did it. So all three country, all three parties contributed to this disaster of, this, of the settlement freeze debacle. Uh, and it was so painful being a specialist uh, working on policy at the time, watching this 10 month, 12 month, 13 month car crash. And you could see it happening. And you wanted begging people not to do this. And all of them made every mistake possible, except Netanyahu who was being as cynical as possible. Um, but it was very painful. So now that really Biden inherits that failure and, and, and all the failures that came before, a dead, a moribund Oslo process with nothing to work with on either side, plus the damage inflicted by Trump. And what he can do is restore relations, get things you know, moving again on the ground, try to improve conditions and, and try to fix US policy so that once again, there is a clear commitment to eventually a two-state solution. He can definitely remove uh, approval for uh, some of these very obnoxious settlements that threaten to cut off first Jerusalem and then also Bethlehem from other parts of the West Bank. And uh, yeah, he can take a much stronger stance. Uh, and I think, you know, it's one thing that's very important to understand is not all the Republicans are on board with the Trump Kushner annexation plan. I think a lot of the international Republicans, internationalist Republicans in the Senate, Marco Rubio, Lindsey Graham, uh, and these kind of people who, who, whatever else you want to say about them, are not, you know, um, are not Jared Kushner. Uh, I think they remain skeptical about the United States being basically in openly in favor of a greater Israel with Palestinian banter stands sprinkled around it. Uh, and, and so I think they, they will not kick up much of a fuss. Biden wants to return the United yeah. States meanwhile, to the rational policy. Yeah. yeah, meanwhile, we should just note we have 650,000 Israelis on the ground, um, yeah. which uh, constitutes a presence that constitutes a very formidable block. Well, uh, that, I mean, it will be very, very, very difficult to, uh, to yeah. roll back. So Everyone I there know are facts about it. As indeed was the intention, let me just finish. Yeah, uh, sure. thought. There are facts on the ground um, that, that um, make um, any rollback a very difficult proposition, other than rhetorical. Um, right. And this is, I think, also important to understand about the last half decade, the BB uh, uh, Trump alliance. Um, not only was there um, a green light given to ongoing Israeli settlement activity, but for all intents and purposes, Palestinians were removed from the diplomatic equation. There was almost, they were ghosted, they were disappeared. There was no discussion of Palestinians. And, and, and they, like, 
and they, they contributed to that. Themselves. They, they, yeah, did. Um, they, they yeah. when Kushner's plan came out, they, their only response was, "We don't like it." They could have put down right. their own talking right. points. Right. Their right. own right. 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 feeble statement right. had been. You and I have talked about. This. You and I have talked about this uh, repeatedly over the course of our time together, uh, the way in which Palestinians again and again are taken by surprise by- Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's very uh, So what I'm here, I want to, I'm another example. Uh, well, I just wanted to add one other thing. Everyone I know who thinks about the, the long-term relationship of Israel and Palestinians has moved on from a Westphalian to state position. I, I think that's clearly not gonna happen. So now we have to think in terms of things like uh, you know, confederations, Benelux models, things like that, possibly eventually with Jordan involved in it. You know, that, that's necessary. It's still going to have to be a situation where everybody gets their full first class citizenship and their self determination. But it's not going to be a Yugoslav model with Croats here and Serbs there and Slovenes here. And that, you know, that's, that could work in some places and it probably would have been the right answer here, but I think it's, it's gonna be, it's, it's kind of OBE as they say. Right. So I just wanna highlight the, the point about the disappearance of the Palestinians from the equation, the diplomatic equation over the last half decade, because it points up the focus upon bilateralism that Israel has been quite successful in and the United States has fostered, which is to say the development of state to state relations, uh, something which Menachem Begin understood very well in the Israel-Egypt uh, peace negotiation. He wasn't particularly interested in fostering another sovereign entity um, in historic Palestine. He was interested in uh, in fostering relations with state powers, and in his case, the most important state power. And so too, Netanyahu has been, um, uh, has excelled in, uh, in fostering such relations um, throughout the world and particularly in the Middle East in ways that alter the equation significantly. Um, why don't you say a word about that? Um, yeah. I know we have to move um, in a minute or two to Q&A. So yeah. maybe just say- uh, On bilateralism, uh, there, yeah, there's, there's two important things to be said about bilateralism. One is that now is the nature of the relationship between Israel and the Arab countries that are willing to engage with it. And there's another five or six that may or may not, uh, at least four, I mean, definitely Qatar, uh, we'll do it if they can. Uh, Oman, it's a matter of time. Morocco would like to. Saudi Arabia is the big question mark. Um, so, you know, we'll see. But we've already got Egypt and Jordan. So that's a big chunk of the Arab world that is engaged. And some of the Arab world is just not that interested. Um, it's an interesting case. People forget about Mauritania, which had relations with Israel and then didn't have relations with Israel. And people just forget about it. But it is, it is an Arab country, a very far-flung one. Um, so now each of those countries is making uh, normalization with Israel. They, they packaged the UAE and Bahrain under this Abraham Accord thing. It's, that's a, just a rhetorical device to, make, to, to aid Trump in, in, in uh, Washington and to make it easier for other Arab countries to join by making it seem like a joint thing. But the, but the actual agreements signed by the UAE and Bahrain are very different agreements. There are a lot of differences. And each, they have very different reasons for doing it. Sudan has a very different reason. So each of them are going to make individual separate uh, normalization agreements. Those that are willing to do it are going to do it very differently. And it's all bilateral. And that brings us to the other angle of bilateralism, which is between Israel and the Palestinians. Palestinians have been, and one of the reasons they disappeared, um, there are many reasons in the past five years or so, is they didn't have a national liberation strategy of their own because they haven't really had a functional national leadership. Uh, we can talk about that if anybody wants to talk about that, I will. I mean, there are people like Abbas who imagine themselves to be national leaders, but they don't think as national leaders. He thinks like the mayor of Ramallah. He doesn't think like a, you know, a Palestinian national leader would. And they don't, and neither do the Hamas guys. And so, you know, they just lack a national leadership. So over the past five years, if you'd said, let me rephrase it. When I asked Palestinian leaders, what's your strategy? You would get one of two answers. Either they would say the Arab peace initiative, right? All the Arab, Israel makes peace with the Palestinians and all the Arab and the Muslim countries uh, normalize with Israel and that's it at, at the end. Or they would describe that without saying the Arab peace initiative. Now, 
it's very stupid to make your national strategy something that is not only determined, but defined by somebody else, right? Because it was defined down now to the point where according to the UAE and Bahrain and others, it's, it's uh, not uh, peace first and then normalization, it's normalization first and then maybe something to do with the occupation after, or maybe not. You know, hope, I mean, just no, no annexation, don't make the situation particularly worse. Um, so I think Palestinians that are confronted because of all of that with not only the urgent need to actually make a national strategy of their own that they control and define that they used to have, but that they've given up on, you know, in recent years and the, the disaster that that's produced for them. Also, they need to recognize, and I think they are recognizing, their, the outcome of their uh, liberation struggle and their, and their quest for citizenship and self-determination is now once again, or maybe even for the first time completely, simply a direct um, dynamic with, between them and the Jewish Israelis. That's it, there's no one else involved, right? Um, Iran can bleat, but they don't care about it. The Arab states are either not involved or they're interested in some kind of an arrangement. The United States is not going to save them. The UN is not going to save them. No one's going to save them. There is no United Arab bloc behind them. There is no leveraging the Arab world anymore. So it's them and the Israelis. And they're going to have to, you know, figure it out between the two of them. And this is a very painful, stark realization for Palestinians. Because if that's the way you put it, and you think of it as a conflict, and you think of it in zero sum or at least um, competition terms. This is the most one-sided, uh, you know, unequal, asymmetrical power struggle in modern history. Uh, if you look at the Israeli state and the Palestinian people, uh, there you will not find a, a more um, asymmetrical um, struggle in terms of power uh, in modern history. But um, the Palestinians are a reality and they're not going to go away and they can of course leverage the power of the weak and other things and it's still they have agency and what they do and don't do can and will make a difference so that's that's the other kind of bilateralism which is now it's much down to, to palestinians and israelis bilateral yeah much more to be said on that but abir yep. do you want to open up for questions yeah yeah i would love to uh, first i want to thank you both uh, it was um Really amazing. So many things that I, I didn't think about and uh, some things that I did, of course, uh, but um, to hear about it so elaborately, it's, it's, I really want to thank you. Well, uh, Abir, I didn't have a chance to say thank you to you and, and your community. So thank you. Yeah, our pleasure, our pleasure. Um, I, I do want to, just before we go to, to questions, which is a, it's a significant part and I want to leave uh, some time for that. Uh, I do want to say that this is, uh, for those of you who were not here in the beginning, this is a part of a series that we just started and this is the first uh, session out of three that deals with Israel and US relations uh, in the last decade and try to conclude uh, <laughs> this decade somehow. Uh, this session is um, dealing with uh, the Israel-Palestinian conflict, obviously. Uh, the next one, which is going to be January 6th, is going to uh, deal with the Jewish communities here uh, and in Israel and the difference and a little bit what happened between those two communities in the last decade. Uh, and um, we're going to have a conversation with Dr. Sarah Yael Hirschhorn uh, from the West Western, uh, um, Southwestern University. Uh, which is uh, which also know Hussein and um, she's yeah. just great. The and first class scholar, really brilliant. Uh, we have a commercial. Uh, for yeah, <laughs> with pleasure, with with great pleasure. And uh, our last session going to be February eleventh uh, is going to feature and uh, have a conversation with um, um, Peter Beinar. He's going to deal with uh, the larger um, uh, Arab world and how it changed a little bit uh, in the last decade, not a little, I think, um, but we're going to hear about all about that uh, in the near future. So now uh, we still have some uh, a good amount of time to have some questions. I know some of you um, uh, wrote to me, uh, but I think if you can just raise your hand you know, um, virtually or physically, um, it's both fine. 
And I, I, will, I want to hear your question rather than read your question. So uh, I think it would be nicer. So if you have a question, please uh, raise your hand right now. I'll go through the names and, um, okay. So let's start with um, Alexander Longo. Alexander. Yeah, hello. Hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Uh, thanks for the discussion. I was wondering uh, now after let's say 10 years, how would you look back at the Obama years like the two terms now that normally new Democratic candidate is going to assume office? And how do you look back at Israel's kind of almost, almost made hostility towards uh, Barack Obama and his administration? As we, for instance, recently saw that um, there was like even great relief that someone like Susan Rice was like not appointed to like one of the most prominent uh, positions in uh, the incoming administration. Thank you. I could answer very quickly and then I think David is better put, but uh, I would just say I, I think uh, Obama first term was a disaster from which we still haven't recovered for the reasons I said. And Obama second term, he just sat it out. He wouldn't touch the issue and he let Kerry do it, but without the weight of the president. So it was, you know, pointless, useless. And the whole thing was summed up by Kerry giving a speech right at the very end of the Obama administration, which if he had been given at the beginning of the first term or even the beginning of the second term and backed up with, with actual policies would have been a great speech and a breakthrough and a wonderful watershed. But because it came at the very end and was attached to nothing, it was just a self-serving, whiny, horrible, I mean, I was just, it, it, it nauseated me with that. It was, it was really awful. Uh, so I don't look back from the, on this policy. I think Obama was catastrophically bad with good intentions which goes to show you how difficult it is. Sorry, David. Yeah, I have a somewhat more charitable view. I mean, it's hard not to be more charitable than that yeah. um, if, you if you disliked uh, Obama. Um, you know, I think, um, I think he understood the need um, to affect some measure of distance uh, between Washington uh, and Israel, um, especially with respect to the settlement project. Um, I think he was weakened by any number of foreign policy miscues um, that undercut his legitimacy, maybe beginning you know, with his opening uh, uh, speech in Cairo um, uh, and failure to come to, uh, come to Jerusalem, um, which you know, was kind of a head scratcher from the get-go. But um, it, such, act, such symbol symbolic acts um, assume great significance. Um, nonetheless, they should be overcome uh, with substantive policy. And I think, I guess I see it as a, as a bit more complicated insofar as I think um, both the Republicans uh, and, the, and Israel under Netanyahu were really out to torpedo his every initiative. Um, Mitch McConnell said it very explicitly uh, what his main objective was in life. It was to prevent, mm -hmm. I think in 2010, to prevent uh, Obama from getting a second term. So I think the intentions uh, in effecting um, a policy that would um, that would uh, place more weight on the efforts towards self-determination of Palestinians. Uh, I think the intent was there. Mm -hmm. I think there was, I think he had an asset in Joe Biden, uh, given Biden's own uh, strong ties to Israel, uh, which I don't think were used quite as much as they uh, should have been. I think Biden has real assets in, in, in being a presence. Um, but I guess I see uh, the equation as, as more complicated by these other factors. Um, and I'm, you know, uh, a Republican team that basically no longer was willing to play by the rules of the Democratic game, and Netanyahu, Netanyahu who's just unequivocally opposed. And it's amazing that we've gone this long and failed to mention what was the ultimate wedge issue, which was not Palestine and, and, and not uh, the Arab states per se, but Iran. Yeah. Um, and the Iran, uh, that was the issue that served as the wedge uh, between uh, between Obama and 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 uh, and Netanyahu, um, and there was on Netanyahu's part 
kind of laser-like focus from the get-go on that issue. And Obama was destined to fail at every turn, and, and Netanyahu was prepared to show him up and humiliate him at every turn. Um, Obama, for his part, uh, had no uh, high regard for Netanyahu and didn't mind uh, embarrassing him as well. So you, I think you really had more than a catastrophic uh, Obama policy. You had a kind of um, catastrophic convergence of, of vectors uh, that produced uh, a real combustible mix. Well, I said um, also that Palestinians so, <clears throat> contributed. A little bit more. <clears throat> Sorry? No, I said the Palestinians contributed as well. They couldn't have handled it worse either. Yeah, so, I mean, yeah, I think all three parties contributed. And you they the Republicans adhere to their, but to their that general. Was, <laughs> yeah, they adhere to, I'd say, their general commitment to uh, passive reaction to that mm -hmm. which hoisted upon them. Um, you know, mm -hmm. What might happen if the Palestinian Authority um, and the very smart people who uh, often advise it uh, put together a proposal of their own? That would be a, a, a really important uh, entry into the into the dip diplomatic game. Um, surely wouldn't be accepted, you know, with wild acclaim mm -hmm. all involved, but it would indicate a seriousness of intent. They've so, had think, no, no, no they, that's not what I mean. They've had they've had many serious proposals in the past. But the thing is, when with the Obama administration, when the settlement freeze issue came to a head, it was vital that they knew that Obama was not going to be able to make that stick and he was going to walk away from it. And they couldn't take the same position because they couldn't walk away from it if, if they locked themselves in. And that's what they did. And it was incredibly dumb. And it's not like there weren't people warning them because there were. Right. But I just want to say that um, it's really important to note uh, under what conditions of constraint Palestinians operate. I mean, in a very yeah, sure. sense, there is uh, an all-consuming occupation. Um, oh, it's, intent, its effect, if not intent, is to dehumanize, is to break down. Absolutely, well, of course. No effectively. And they, they couldn't have fewer yeah. options. I agree with that. They well, couldn't have fewer options, which is why their their policies. Let me just finish this point. It it has been accompanied by an ongoing process of settlement of Israeli Jews in the West Bank that really forces us to ask whether, as Naron Ben Benisti did in I think 1982, whether the clock has struck midnight. And I think one of the things we need to think about um, to overcome. Uh, the zero-sum proposition uh, by which this um, uh, conflict has often uh, played uh, is what we hear <coughs> in Israel increasingly, <coughs> which is the idea of an Arab-Jewish political partnership. Mm -hmm. um, uh, this may be sort of not just a, a banal platitude, but really a program for full political enfranchisement, um, regardless of what the ultimate uh, diplomatic and political solution is. Um, and I say this um, not only because I want to, not, not principally because I want to uh, hammer the final nail into the two-state solution, but really as a measure of offering hope to uh, those who um, are seeking justice um, and safety and security. What, what can we think of uh, that might help come to the like a lot of political, well, it's something akin to what we're beginning to see in Israel. Certainly, um, discussions on the left, um, the Joint Arab List, and there have been discussions with Meretz. Um, there's increasing attention to this idea of uh, Joint Arab Jewish Partnership. Yeah, um, there, again, without a, a defined. And I think that's one way in which we can think past yeah. uh, the zero sum game we often. Ourselves in. I, I agree with that completely. I mean, there is a basis for it, which is basically um, a shared commitment to individual and, and group human rights and, and a basic, you know, um, uh, humanistic values. And so what you're going to find then is potentially a convergence on that ground against extremists and exclusionists on both sides who want to say, you know, uh, who want to raise the banner of some kind of supremacy or absolute um, authority based on, you know, um, uh, mainly religion could be ethnicity. So there is certainly a basis yeah, I mean, over time. 
It may be, I mean, this is the question. It may be that the prior paradigm, the Oslo paradigm uh, of separation has run its course. It may be. I think, um, I think looks at how integrated uh, the settlers are into yeah. an infrastructure that is very hard to, uh, it's very hard to imagine it being uprooted. If so, then it seems to me the relevant discourse is a discourse of equality. And again, that isn't necessarily to say there should be one state between uh, the Jordan and the Mediterranean. There is one polity for all intents and purposes right. ruled by one major power. That can assume many different forms. Exactly. But it does seem to me that you know what, what we need to, need to be agitating for, uh, those of us who care passionately about the cause for peace, those of us who have deep commitments to that place, to Israel, to its people, to the land, and to the cause of justice for Palestinians, what what we probably need to begin to embrace much more loudly is is a language of equality. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I, I know we need to get on to the next question, but I just want to say, when you look at the Middle East, there are a lot of intractable problems, the oldest of which is Palestinian-Israeli, but not the only one, where uh, confederation and uh, separation within some kind of unity um, is the is is the most logical solution at this point? You, it applies in Iraq. It applies in Yemen. It applies in Libya. It applies in Syria. It's already, to some extent, very imperfectly the case in Lebanon. Uh, and uh, I think that there are quite a few um, Middle Eastern societies where some version of federation, confederation, uh, loose unification within a broad whole, but where people have, a, you know, a great deal of self-determination within that um, unity is, is, the, um, is the obvious uh, way out of uh, interminable conflict. And this may be an example of that, especially if you can rope the Jordanians eventually into it. Do we take uh, another question? Um, David Bernard. Uh, can you ask your question, please? Hello. Thank you for taking my question. I recently heard a wonderful interview by two authors, Einat Wilf and Adi Schwartz, one a journalist and one a former member of the Knesset, who've written this book entitled The War of Return. They made the point in the book that the single sticking point around the lack of a peace agreement is the demand the Palestinians have to give them the ability to return to their land that they left, their, their homes and their areas. And that in, in, they have never agreed to remove that requirement. And the Israelis can almost certainly never agree to that. That point has not been highlighted sufficiently, I don't believe, and I wondered whether it is real. Is it true that that no. is a demand that has been consistent throughout all peace negotiations over these many, many years? And is that the sticking point? And if no. so, isn't that an area that should be focused on? Thank yeah, you. if it were true, it would be, but it's completely false. Um, it is true that Palestinian leaders have never publicly said in, in any clear way, so also that their own people get this, uh, which they should have done but haven't that uh, they understood from the outset that there was a need to make a major compromise on the question of return, but they did. Uh, and since 1993, the Palestinians were, uh, negotiators behind closed doors, were clear that uh, they were going to be entering into a two-state solution with Israel, where Israel would still have the sovereign authority to determine who would enter or not their country. And so that Palestinians were going to negotiate a package for the, for the refugees that would include compensation and some kind of Israeli statement that involved a degree of responsibility and figure out a, a formula for the exercise of a very limited amount of return for a group of people that the Israelis and the Palestinians, but especially the Israelis would agree to in a committee. The Palestinians would call it return, though the, the numbers would be small on an annual basis. The uh, Israelis were probably going to call it family reunification or something like that. And the, even to the point that at the why at the um, uh, tight uh, um, uh, negotiations in 
even when the second father was going, sorry, the Taba, that's right. Taif is the Lebanese accord. The Taba negotiations that were going on in, in uh, early 2001 uh, and late 2000 in December and January, um, they were negotiating numbers. And again, when uh, Abbas talked with um, Olmert, they were again discussing numbers. So, uh, you know, th this book is, is really wrong, in fact. I, I do think there's a complaint to be made about I mean, Palestinian leaders not being straightforward with their public about this, but that's a different story. The big sticking point, if there is right. one, I mean, I mean, other, the, other than everything, the biggest sticking point is Jerusalem. Not refugees. I think I think that's right. I think, I think I mean how many how many items have been put on the agenda as the the ultimate sticking point? I mean, yeah, water any, even some think. people said Isn't water uh, settlements, yeah. Jerusalem, right of return. I will say this about the right of return. I think it's a very it's a sticky it's a sticky problem. Okay. But I want to just go back to what Hussein said that in the terminal stages of the Oslo peace process, the last weeks, we're talking about Taba in Sinai, January, 2001, Bill Clinton is packing his bags. Mm. Hild Olmert is trying to uh, get uh, uh, what he can before um, an impending election. Yeah, Barak. It is said that negotiators at Taba agreed on a formula for the right of return that included the following principles. One, recognition of the right of return, two, dependent upon uh, the, uh, the geographic location, two, the geographic location for which would be decided upon by the two principal parties. The assumption being that the right of return would be exercised in a new state of Palestine. Mm -hmm. yeah. So the right of recognition of the right of return is very important to Palestinians. According to this formula, Israel agreed to recognize the right on the assumption that it would be exercised in the state of Palestine. Thus, refugees could come back, as it were, but yeah. to the state of Palestine. Yeah. In addition, there would be some recognition by Israel of partial responsibility for the Nakba of 1948. And as Hussein mentioned, uh, a number of 50,000 was yeah. mentioned as the number of those who would be permitted to return to Israel proper. This was the package that, according to um, secondhand accounts, the negotiators, negotiators at Taba um, arrived at. And this was seen as, um, you're, you're, you're right, David, in highlighting it as a, as a really tricky issue. Um, but it was said that even their progress had been made. And then as Hussein mentioned, there was also discussion in, in the conversations between Abbas and, and Omar in 2008. I, by the way, I so, heard it firsthand. I, think I heard it should be, from the lady. I, I mean, he told me this directly. I think we're cautious about assuming that, you know, any one issue is the issue, uh, the sine qua non, without which there uh, would, would be an agreement. Um, there are many issues that appear at different points right. as the pressing issue. Ultimately, I think it comes mm -hmm. down to political will on the part of both sides. Um, and as we have seen in other places around the world, most certainly um, uh, in the case of, of Northern Ireland, um, when there is political will, um, uh, you can move mountains, um, at least a, a, a few millimeters. Okay, so this was outstanding, really. I, I, I learned so much and I just want to say just so many topics that uh, came up here that I think they are just an opening to, uh, for further discussion, uh, hopefully in the future. Um, so thank you so much, Professor David Myers, Dr. Hussein Ibish. Thank you for spending some time with us. Um, you know, this uh, thought-provoking uh, conversation about uh, uh, an important um, uh, subject, definitely when we speak on, um, on US-Israel relations. Mm. And I'm sure that the other aspects in our other sessions uh, that's coming up will also um, uh, be uh, will we'll also contribute to understanding this uh, very eventful decade that we had. Yeah. Abir, I just I just want to say one one uh, one thing uh, in conclusion, which is it's very easy to despair, yeah. uh, especially when looking at the last decade. Um, what I think it's important to note is one the constancy of change in history, as we have seen in the United States when uh, we thought we were sinking into an abyss. Uh, out of which it would be impossible to emerge. And in fact, change is afoot. 
And the other thing is that most constructive change happens really from the bottom up, yeah. uh, at the grassroots level. And there is so much amazing change that is happening on the ground in Israel and Palestine. Um, we really need to focus a lot of our attention there as well. And uh, can I just add to that? Um, for those looking at this from the outside, the simplest way of avoiding the biggest mistakes is not to think of Israelis and Palestinians as blocks or collectivities, but as individuals, a bunch of people to be considered as, as individual human beings and individual families and then individual communities. But don't lose sight of the fact that you're talking about people, you know, individual human beings. And once you do that, becomes a lot harder to think in, in stereotypical terms, reductive terms, and you know, start thinking in terms of chess pieces you move around and, and stuff that's really going to get you in a lot of trouble. Well, thank you for both both of these comments because I think they were they are significant and important to remember uh, when dealing with this subject. What a great note to end. So thank you so much to all of you for being on with us. Thank you, uh, David. Thank you, Hussein, again, and we'll see you uh, next time. Uh, so, join you again sometime, Abiyo. Thank you very much. Kotov. Thanks, everybody.